Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, October 13, 2016. This is Week in Charts. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often say, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I need to give credit where credit is due. I got that from Greg Morris. All right, what we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about this week there from both a uh, what's going on in a psychological perspective and following your plan during adverse conditions and all kinds of things. I think are going to come up from that. Uh, your questions on trading and your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, wait until we get to the actual charts, which we'll get to as soon as possible before you start asking questions. And when you ask a question, question he, tried, he tried to say, ask about one individual stock at a time. You can ask about 10 stocks. Just ask, just put the ticker in and then hit return. And I haven't memorized every ticker yet, so if you don't mind, put the uh, put the actual ticker in so I'll know what it is. Okay, uh, this week we're going to talk about deliberate practice. And I really couldn't find a good definition on deliberate practice. It's like I know what it is, but it's hard for me to – define it and one way I can define it is getting better at getting better and it's not just going through the motions but it's working to get deliberately better at what you're doing regardless of what you're doing but I'm going to obviously talk about it as it relates to trading so deliberate is the key word Ander Erickson says that the differences between expert performers and normal adults reflect a lifelong period of deliberate effort to improve performance in a specific domain. Now, notice he said specific. We're going to get into a lot more details on that. And... Deliberate practice is not about becoming great at everything in your field every day and all the time. It's more of a sharpshooting versus taking a shotgun approach. Bruce Lee once said, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. And Linda Rasky once said, all you need is one pattern to be successful. Last weekend, as you may know, I was at Traders for a Cause charity event and seminar. And I met a lot of interesting people there. And one guy I met was very successful as an entrepreneur. And a young guy, very young and successful, a little bit of both. And he wanted to get into trading, but he'd only been trading for about a month, or he's only been studying trading for about a month. And he was this huge sponge. And even he even defines himself as that, a sponge. And my impression was he's trying to grasp everything at one time. And I told him repeatedly, look, just find one pattern. Just do one thing and get really good at doing that. And I talked a lot about TKOs when my speech came around. And just, just trade TKOs and persistent pullbacks. Or just trade persistent pullbacks. So obviously, um, I like a combination of thereof. So focus on that one thing and get good at that one thing. Now, according to Anderson, you're going to need a few things. You're going to need some motivation. You'll need some pre-existing knowledge. You're going to need immediate feedback, and you're going to need repetition. I can't speak for other professions, but the good news is all of these things, I'm not going to say they're easy, but they're certainly possible when it comes to trading. Now, let's break it down. First of all, let's talk about motivation. 
Now, I don't want to go all fresh, but psychology on you. But you really need to know what is your true motivation for trading. And I see a lot of people trade for the wrong reasons. Now, you're kind of thinking, well, Dave, you just trade to make money. Yeah, but the reason people get into trading is for the wrong reason. So you need to think about motivation, but more specifically, your motivation. So what do you want? Well, I want to make money, Dave. Duh, he's such an idiot. Well, yeah, I know you want to make money, but why do you want to trade? Why do you want to make money trading? And if your answer is because I'd like to make money trading, and that's what I want to do, which should be everyone's answer, obviously, then that's fine. But if you want to trade to prove to somebody that you could trade or because your boss is a jerk and you want to just go out and make a bunch of money so you no longer need to deal with this jerk anymore or because your spouse thinks you're an idiot or you think your spouse thinks you're an idiot, whatever the case may be, and you want to prove yourself to him or her, or you want to prove yourself to your friends. There's only one reason to trade, and that's to make money. And that's for yourself. That needs to be your own goal. And you need to forget about all those extraneous reasons. If you're trading for the wrong reason, then you're going to be un unsuccessful from the get-go. That I can almost promise. Now, the other thing is, are you willing to approach trading like any other profession? A gentleman I was talking about a few seconds ago was very successful in the IT field. And I kept asking him, how long did that take? And he's like, well, I've been coding since I was a kid and blah, blah, blah. And so it took him a while. He was very successful at a very young age. But that success didn't come overnight. And it's been said, and this is something we'll get to in a few minutes. But an overnight success takes about 10 years. When some artist burst upon the scene, you think, wow, this person's amazing. I mean, provided they're just not like a one-hit wonder. But when somebody burst upon the scene, they've been at it for a while. That I can guarantee. So the question is, are you willing to approach trading like any other profession? Meaning that, are you willing to put the time in, and as we'll see in a few minutes, the repetitions, are you willing to study? And trading is actually a little harder in some ways than some of, of the professions that you might think are very hard. Because the professions that are very hard, at least there's some sort of well-defined plan. You go to school, you work as an intern, and then they turn you loose. And you certainly, even if there weren't laws preventing it, you certainly wouldn't say, oh, I'm going to be a doctor tomorrow. I'm going to run down the Wally World, pick up some X-Acto knives, and I'm going to start carving up people. You obviously wouldn't do that. But in trading, people people do just that. I mean, I know it's a bit of an extreme example, but people dive right in. The barrier to entry is so small. And it was funny, over the weekend, he talked about that too. You have to answer a few questions from your broker and they don't even care what you answer those. It's not like somebody looks at it and says, oh, well, you shouldn't trade. You're not qualified. They don't look to qualify or quantify your answers. You just fill out a little form. That's just a CMA for the broker. You put a few thousand dollars in your account. Bam, you're a trader. Now, getting back to what Anderson Erickson said, I'm sorry, Anders Erickson, is you'll need some pre-existing knowledge. Now, related to trading, you really need to know how markets really work, okay? And my definition of technical analysis is reading the emotions of the market participants while embracing your own. So if we look at certain chart patterns, 
at least with my methodology, they're directly related to the psychology of the market. A case in point I often use is let's say you think you've got a really good setup, okay? And you're looking at the chart. And, you know, okay, I'm following Dave's setup here. Oh, we got this beautiful little bow tie coming in or whatever the case may be. But if there's a big mountain of overhead supply just above where your setup is, then anyone who still owns the stock from this range, and keep in mind that markets have long memories. I don't want to turn into a, a lesson on overhead supply. But there are people behind these bars. And some of them probably should be behind bars, but that's another story. So you have to remember that you're reading the emotions of these participants. So you probably don't want to get into this trade because your gains might be limited to the distance between your entry to that overhead supply, as I talk about quite often. Now, one thing, sometimes it helps to get out. Not that you always learn something new, but it sort of reminds you of what you already know and also reminds you what you don't know, too, sometimes. But one thing that was said during the conference was you're trading traders, not markets. And that dovetails perfectly into my definition, my personal definition of technical analysis. You're reading the emotions of others while embracing your own. As I said as I say quite often, as Douglas, Mark Douglas, the late great Mark Douglas says, all it takes is one A-ho to screw up a perfectly good trade. So you have no control over that A-ho. So you're trading, trading, <clears throat> excuse me. You're trading traders and not markets. So you will need to know what to look for in the first place and that's where he was saying you're going to need some is this knowledge and then you're gonna to have to know how to execute and that goes down to the money and position management the good thing about that is it's fairly mechanical uh, in 30 minutes to an hour I could explain the basis well in 10 minutes I can explain the basis of the money management takes me a little bit longer to explain the nuances and maybe a tad bit longer with some of the specifics like setting a protective stop and I spent uh, two weekend charts back to back just on that so uh, take out the stock selection and questions uh, part or stock picking and questions part and that's at least two hours spent just on that but the good thing is that's fairly mechanical a little discretion with a little experience that's another lesson on top of that but the good news is that's fairly mechanical now you're going to need feedback the great thing about the market is you do get a lot of feedback and then I think going back to the original list uh, it was listed as immediate feedback by uh, mr. Erickson and in markets, you do get that immediate feedback. Now, sometimes you might have to wait a little bit for positions to work, but at least you're getting the feedback for whether or not it's working. And even if you're swing to intermediate term, and even that swing trade might take a few weeks, at least you're getting the, the intermediate or the immediate feedback. Now, the bottom line is the market is always the final arbiter. But this can create a bit of a dilemma. If you're successful in a trade, was your success through following the process? As I often preach, and I'm, I stop short of putting a slide in because I do it so many times, but the market could be a bad teacher. You might get stopped out on a position, as we did the last couple of days in a couple of positions, and you might be so inclined to hold on. Well, this market's getting a little oversold in here. We might go roaring straight back up over the next few days, and you might make a lot of money on those trades that you didn't honor your stop on. Now, if you recognize that you did something stupid and still made money, 
then don't get too excited about your stupidity because longer term, that's going to catch up with you. Okay? I've seen people do some really stupid things and make a lot of money. But eventually it'll catch up with you. I had a friend turn like five thousand dollars, as I often tell a story, into about a million bucks. But he round tripped it. He did it through excessive risks. And what's it hoisted by your own petard? He eventually was it eventually caught up with him. So you could do some really stupid things. You could take a lot of excessive risk, but eventually it's gonna catch up with you. Now, here's the tough part. If you're not successful on a trade, and a lot of beginners don't realize this. They think, well, it wasn't successful. I must suck. But was your lack of success through following the process? If you did everything right, meaning that you picked a decent setup, your stop was outside the normal volatility, you intended to take profits at an initial profit target based on that initial stop, and then you fully intended on trailing that stop higher, and you were able to do at least a few of these things, enter where you were supposed to enter, put the stop in, maybe trail a stop a little bit, but you still got stopped out for a loss, then that's actually a positive even though there's less money in your account. And that could be difficult for many, that your failure is actually a success. You have successfully failed, or failed successfully, I should say. Now, repetition is key. But one thing you have to realize is it's not just repetition. Now, there seems to be a disagreement between Malcolm Gladwell, who I'm a huge fan of, and I would strongly urge you to read all of his books, specifically Outlier, Outliers. And I think people may have confused his 10,000-hour rule with that being a given. And maybe Mr. Gladwell inadvertently put too much emphasis on the 10,000 hour rule. So Mr. Erickson is more like, well, it's not the 10,000 hours. It's 10,000 specific hours or 10,000 hours doing the right thing. And if you're doing the right thing and it's truly deliberate practice, then I could shorten that down to a lot less than 10,000 hours. It's still going to take a lot of repetitions, but it's not going to necessarily take the 10,000 hours. So I think that, I think Mr. Gladwell and Mr. Erickson are really pretty much on the same page. It just, Mr. Gladwell has the appearance that he just says, well, you just do this for 10,000 hours. Well, you have to do it for 10,000 hours, but work hard at getting better. And as Mr. Erickson says, you're going to need some help. And I'll give you an example of that. My daughter wanted to be a singer. And I remember I was outside peeling in the garage, as I often do, trying to get my head on straight. And I heard this noise coming from my house. I know I've told the story before, but there's a second part to it. And it... It could probably best be described as an animal being tortured. So I'm thinking, what in the hell is going on? So I ran into the house, and there was nobody in the house, but I heard the shower on, and my daughter was in there singing in the shower. And she was horrible. But we got her voice lessons, and she got better and better and better. And two weeks ago, she tried out for our district choir, and she made it, which allowed her to try out for the state choir, and she made it. But it was not without a lot of practice, but not so much just practicing, which doesn't hurt. But through a voice coach and through her teachers, 
she's gotten better and better and knows how to practice. So it's the deliberate practice that makes that's most important. Now, I could bang on a piano for 10,000 hours, but it would still sound like someone banging on a piano. I mean, I'd probably get a little bit better. But if someone would to teach me what to do and how to do it, it might not take me 10,000 hours, and I would be much better than just banging on a piano for 10,000 hours. And getting back to the... Getting back to focusing on one thing before I forget, like Bruce Lee said, I don't fear the person who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I do fear the person who's practiced one kick 10,000 times. So find something simple and focus on it and get good at that before moving on. If you can't trade one pattern successfully, you're not going to trade 10. And I remember when I was trying to learn how to play guitar. Now, I don't play guitar anymore or haven't in a long time. So I know I, I suck at it once again. But I actually got pretty good for a while. I wasn't great, but I was pretty good. There were a few songs that I could play fairly well that were somewhat difficult songs. And I wanted to play guitar. And a few times in college, I asked a couple of people who knew how to play guitar, hey, show me to play guitar. And they would grab my hand my left hand, and they would mash it into a chord. And they says, okay, hold the fingers on the screen and, and play it. Like, uh, and they would like groan when the strings would buzz and everything would sound horrible. And then they would try to mash my hand into a C card or an E card, whatever the case may be. And I found myself resisting, and I just, I just sucked at it. And I said, well, I'll never be able to play guitar. Well, a couple years out of college, I was at a buddy of mine's house, and he had a pretty extensive guitar collection and was pretty good at guitar. And I said, I'd like to learn how to play guitar. So he did the same thing with me. He mashed my hand into a few little uh, different positions, and I, I kind of resisted and couldn't loosen up my fingers to do it. And he like, I thought to myself, well, there I go again. And once again, I'm a failure. I don't know what I'm doing. I'll never be able to play. And he kind of said, hmm, scratched his head a little bit. He says, do this. He says, I want you to take your your index finger, and I just want you to hit the top string, the E string, and I want you to push down your index finger, and he showed me how to make a fret, or if that's what it's called. And I just want you to do that. Open, close, open, close. So it was over and over again, but much slower, obviously. He says, I'm going to go take a shower. He goes, I want you to do that, and only that, for the next 10 minutes. So I did that. And when I got back, he says, okay, let's take your ring finger and do the same thing. And then I went from index finger, ring finger. Before you do it, within 20 or 30 minutes, I was playing a little riff and then going up and down the fret. It's like, oh, okay, well, maybe I can play guitar because I just learned with one little thing. And then when I went to teach my daughter how to play many years ago, I just showed her that. And she kind of took the ball and ran with it. And I think by fifth or sixth grade, she was playing Jimi Hendrix, Star Spangled Banner in the talent show, which was uh, makes the father very proud. So the point is, you will need a little instruction, a little direction. And it's not just banging it out for those 10,000 hours. And I'm not just soft selling you on, on what I do. I think no matter what your level is at trading, I'm constantly learning from others. And there's a lot of people that I look up to in this industry. And I was really humbled last week by, by being around some of these traders that were very accomplished and very impressive. So get a little help. And don't be ashamed to get a little help. I don't know why it is in this profession that everyone has to feel like, oh, I'm just going to go in on my own, completely on my own. It's like everyone has help. And I don't know why that is. And if some, some of you guys or girls can tell me why that is, that people feel like they have to do it 100% on their own, just let me know. I mean, even when people successfully trade my stuff over like a year or so, especially if we have a really good year, a lot of times they'll say, well, Dave, I get it. I'm going to go off on my own now. It's like, well, wait a minute. Treat me like an institution would. 
you were happy with my performance last year, well, keep me on staff. Let me keep helping you pick new stocks. Maybe I could find something that you didn't possibly notice. Maybe you could still learn from me. So don't feel bad or don't be ashamed to ask for help. Now, I've got thousands of hours of information out there completely for free. So start there if you don't want to pay for something. Go get on my deliberate service, okay? Watch that. And then go back in hindsight. See what I said. See what worked. See what didn't. And learn from that. Now, when it comes to delivered practice, as it relates to trading, there's a before. And when I'm going through the charts, I like to often look at the new highs, but I look at most of my stocks in the trading, most of the, these stocks in the tradable universe anyway. My tradable universe right now is set to 250,000 on average shares. I forget if it's 50 days or... Uh, 30 days, but it doesn't matter. 30 days would probably be adequate for an average volume. So these stocks are thick enough to trade, and it makes makes for real markets and real trading. Very, very thin stocks don't necessarily adhere to a pure technical analysis because there's not enough participants. Okay, but I don't want to digress too far on that. But I want to make sure things are liquid enough for trade, for both me to trade and for possibly others to trade should I recommend them. And that's why I have that 250,000 on average share volume. And 250,000 can actually be a little thin. But when looking through these charts and I see these big moves, I ask myself, could I have caught the big moves that I'm seeing ahead of time? Or should I have caught the big moves that I'm seeing ahead of time? Now, one thing you have to realize is you can't kiss all the women. There is no be-all, end-all methodology. And my methodology is imperfect. And all methodologies are imperfect. If you had something that was nearly perfect, then I can guarantee you that that was based on an observation that was likely an aberration. It likely won't continue to work if it's perfect, if that makes any sense. I think it was uh, Yogi Berra once said, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. Well, if markets were perfect, they wouldn't be. Markets are imperfect, and systems are imperfect. But if you can live with something that's conceptually correct, you'll do just fine. So ask yourself, could you cut the move ahead of time as you're looking at each one of the charts in, 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 your, in after hours trading, okay? This analysis is done after hours and not – in the heat of battle. Now, if your pattern didn't catch the move, is there a reoccurring pattern? Is there possibly a reoccurring pattern there that would have caught the move? And that's how I learned some of my patterns, or all of my patterns, I should say, over the years. And in more recent times, specifically in the IPOs, I've learned a couple little breakout patterns in IPOs, a couple little things that are a little bit outside of my normal what I call core methodology. Now, if you think you do have something, as I often say, you want to obsess before getting into a trade and not afterwards. So when you're looking at that chart, and I spent 14 hours in a course just on this, but you need to make sure you're asking yourself all the questions, all the things that are brought up, is the stock in a solid trend? Is the stock in an accelerating trend? Is the stock in ideally a persistent trend? Is there any overhead supply? Does the stock trade cleanly or does it look like an electrocardiogram? If you're trading a more efficient market, is there something that you really think that market has the potential to make an inefficient move? Uh, in Forex, I'm not a huge fan of trading Forex, but I do trade Forex. And I like to watch markets as they're making major lows and then making an hourly turn off of those major lows because I think the most amount of people are trapped on the wrong side of the market, or at least the most amount of people have a certain feeling about the market. The most amount of people are bearish, I should say. So when that turn begins to – when that Forex pair begins to roll up, 
then those people are either trapped on the wrong side of the market or they have the wrong feeling about the market and they might be forced to take action. So it's possible they could make an inefficient move. If you're looking at a big, thick stock, such as we're long an energy stock right now that was bottomed out for a long time, trades like 5 million shares a day. Well, that stock bottomed out after many, many years of going lower and begins to rally off the low. So the most amount of people on the wrong side of the market, and I thought it had the potential to make an inefficient move. If you're looking at, and we might be looking at quite a few of these very soon, if you're looking at a big cap stock that's priced for perfection, and I hate to say the F words, but has fundamentals, real fundamentals like real earnings and real assets and not just some sort of promise, I'd much rather trade a stock off a promise, by the way, than reality. But if I did have to incorporate fundamentals into the equation, I would short stocks with good fundamentals that are big, thick stocks that are efficient stocks. And that's the, the basis of the go-go-nomo strategy. And again, like I said, I have a lot of free stuff out there. So read all the free stuff first. And you can get that in the free reports. It's go, go, no mo. It's looking to short these very efficient stocks. So make sure you're obsessing before you get into a trade, not afterwards. Now, the other thing about deliberate practices, and I borrowed this line from, Wall, from um, Market Wizards. Is it intuition or into wishing? Okay. If the market is chopping sideways and you're no longer – you find yourself no longer being patient and you want to just dive right in, then you have to ask yourself, do you really think you have the mother of all setups? So if conditions aren't conducive, you really have to make sure you really have a good setup. Okay, market's been chopping sideways as it has been for months now. And for most of 2016, it's just kind of chopped around. It's been tough trading as a trend follower. So we had to be very, very selective. So on every trade going in, you want to obsess over the pattern. You want to obsess over the chart. You want to make sure you think you have something that could trade in lieu of a lukewarm at best market. Now, the litmus test for me is often, can you walk away and be okay? And I've walked away from a lot of stocks that have taken off. And it seems like specifically this year. And like my wife says, well, at least they were on your radar. Well, yeah, you give yourself some credit for that, but you can't live off of good thoughts, right? But yeah, she's right. At least it was on my radar. But the litmus test is, can you walk away and be okay? like, okay, well, this stock here, it looks good, but I really would like to pull back to be a little deeper. And because it's not deep enough or whatever the case may be, or the case like we had a little metal stock on the Landry list for about a week or two, it just never triggered. It kept going lower and lower and lower and made a deep pullback. Some of my clients actually took it, but it no longer fit my methodology. So you have to have some sort of plan in place, some sort of methodology in place that you're going to follow. And you have to say, yes, I'm going to walk away, but I'm going to be okay. Now, I also, the flip side of that, I call the can't stand it test. If you feel like you would just, it would really bother you if you didn't take that trade because you think it's, it's great and you're willing to take a loss on it because the market conditions might not be conducive or it might be a volatile stock, could Obviously, stop you out. Any stock can stop you out, obviously. But if you can't stand it, then take it, okay? Just be willing to live with the consequences. As I often say, trading all balls down and making decisions, and more importantly, living with them. Now, keep it along the lines of deliberate practice before, easy for me to say. Once you do think you have something, okay, then make a plan. Where are you going to get in? Once you're triggered, where are you going to place that initial protective stop? As I said a few minutes ago, I have two hour-long at least videos just on that. 
Watch those videos if you don't know where to place a stop. Use common sense. If a stock is bouncing around four and five points a day, make sure your stop is outside of that normal volatility. A one or two point stop will get hit. You will get taken out. I can almost guarantee you will lose on the trade. Okay. Good garbage in, garbage out, of course. The best, pick the best and leave the rest. But you're still going to need a fairly liberal stop based on a normal volatility of the market, just in case the, your timing is a little bit off, as it often is. Now, during the trade, you want to work to get better, too. And you do that by following the plan. And following a plan is easier said than done, but sometimes it's not that hard. Sometimes you walk away. I had, I had trouble getting my Forex up and running, and I knew I had an open position on Friday. But I had a stop in place. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to put any any new trades this afternoon when I got to Vegas because the market's going to close a couple hours anyway. Uh, I feel confident in what I have on. I didn't see anything new setting up recently, so I don't have any reasons to put on any new trades. And I could get uh, – and I was looking at – so I did look at some charts on the Internet. But I wasn't sure exactly where my stop was because it was a trailing stop, and I didn't know whether I got stopped out or not. But I found myself thinking, well, I probably got stopped out, and I saw – the yen versus dollar began to implode. And I said, well, if I were watching this, I would I would probably exit the trade because it looks like the move was over with. Well, Monday morning when I got in my office, I fired up a screen and said I was amazed that I was still in the trade. Now, we'll see what happens, but um, we're higher now than we were. But had I been watching the screen, I mean, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Who knows what I've done? Hypothetical question, right? But had I been watching the screen, I may have been tempted to exit early. So sometimes following a plan is not that hard. It's not easy, but it's not that hard. Sometimes you just let it happen. Okay, I put in a hard stop on something a little while ago. I have no idea whether I've been stopped out or not. But instead of watching the screen while I'm doing this presentation, I'm doing this presentation. And I'll find out afterwards whether I got stopped out or not. So sometimes following a plan is not that hard. But as I often say, you have to reduce the amount of observations that you make. And I don't know who said it, but somebody in Market Wizard said it. If some, one of you guys in here knows who it is, please let me know. But they said, sorry about that, I had to, I had to fix something. But they said, be as close as you need to be to the markets, but no further. So if somebody in here knows who said that, please let me know. Be as close as you need to be to the markets, but no further. So if you're doing my stuff, swing to intermediate term trading. You don't have to be here watching every tick. In fact, that could be detrimental to your trading. I know I've, I've told the story a thousand times. But a lot of times I get pissed off looking at a quote screen. And especially now the weather's nice outside. It's nice and kind of a little bit cooler here. It's nice and sunny. I might get pissed off enough to where it's like, you know, screw this. I'll go for a walk. And then I'll come back all sweaty and look at my screen. It's like, oh, wait a minute. Things came back. Now, if only it was simple as just going for a walk every time things go against you and have them always come back. But quite often, it makes me realize how much mental energy I have wasted. Something is nowhere near the stop. And I'm getting all pissed off because I'm losing money. And then I go for a walk and come back and now I'm making money. Or not losing nearly as much. Again, it doesn't always happen this way. But I put myself through that emotional round trip for absolutely no reason. And as I often say, busy traders make good traders. Sometimes turning off your screen is the thing to do. I mean, way back early on in my trading days, right before I went full time, I remember I had a bunch of positions on and I went sail sailed the West Indies. We went on a sailboat trip. We rented a boat and with a bunch of um, 
a bunch of my sailor friends and we toured the West Indies. And when we got back to the airport, I bought a investors business daily and was all excited checking the, the prices that I had made a lot of money. I had pretty much paid for my trip while I was gone. So as soon as I got back to the office, what did I do? I sold everything. And then I watched as it would have doubled and tripled over the next several weeks. It was a leveraged option position. So be as close to the market as you need to be, but no further. There's always going to be a reason to exit a trade, but rarely a reason to stay. And I've talked about this over the past few weeks. The, uh, In fact, you know what? I'm going to turn off a screen right now. i got one screen on. I'm watching that stupid young trade. <laughs> there, I practice what I preach. Oh, I feel better about that. But there's virtually always a reason to exit a trade, but rarely a reason to stay. One of the stocks that were long, bow tied down recently. Client emailed me and said, ah, it doesn't look so good, Dave. Why don't we just exit? We do have a sell signal. I'm like, well, we're in longer-term trend-following mode here. We have a stop in place. Let's just let the chips fall where they may, and then the stock went on to make new highs. That doesn't guarantee it's going to keep making new highs. It won't come down and stop us out. But since that, that observation where he was contemplating leaving the trade, exiting the trade, we have begun to – ratchet that stop up a little higher and trail it higher. We're not doing it today, but obviously. But there was money that would have been left on the table by exiting the trade. And hopefully, and I know you, I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully a year from now, I could point back to that example and say, you see, this is why we don't micromanage. And then if you go back and look at the last couple of weeks of charts, you'll see where I showed where we did have other sell signals, or at the least, the position went for a couple of months where it looked like it was just dead money. Why would you stay in a position that's dead money? Well, if that's part of the original plan, then that's what you do. And keep in mind, I don't want to go, I don't get sidetracked too much. But someone said over the weekend, oh, you could always just get back in. And I didn't want to, I don't want to chime in because it wasn't an appropriate time to do so. But sometimes you can always get back in. Now, I don't know exactly what type of trading they're doing. Maybe they're doing some sort of short-term trading where you can get in and out, in and out, in and out. But big moves come in chunks. You can't always get back in. So just follow the original plan. A lot of traders will lead you to believe, oh, yeah, well, you know, just get out because you can always get back in. Well, if you're trend following, that doesn't always work. Even if it doesn't gap in your favor after you get out, it doesn't gap straight up, let's just say it starts marginally making new highs. Well, when do you get back in? Do you let it keep making new highs? So you find yourself, I don't want to digress too far, too late, I know. But you'll find yourself making more and more decisions. Now, let's talk about deliberate practice afterwards. On every trade, you need to do a post-mortem. Go back and do some honest introspection and what I like to do and I haven't done it so much in recent times but every now and then I'll go back and look at I kind of do it in chunks not so much in each individual trade but I'll go back and look at the past three months I'll just sit down and do it all at one time on an every trade ask yourself if you were just seeing this trade back the chart out uh, with telecharts, pretty easy. Well, just pretty much all charting package, you could do it. Just back arrow and go back to your original setup and do some honest introspection. And now you have no emotions attached or no excitement attached to the trade. You might have some emotions, but no excitement, no potential excitement. And, hey, what did you see? Now, I haven't done it as much in more recent times, but every now and then I'll think to myself, what was I doing? Was I just trying to make something happen? But in prior years, I'd see stocks look like electrocardiogram. I'm like, what the hell was I doing? And you're going to find as you get further down in your career, you'll find yourself doing that less and less. But do some honest introspection. And was that introspection, I try, he tried to say, was that setup really that great? Now, did you actually follow your plan or did you micro -self, micromanage yourself out of the trade? 
as I just said, there's always, virtually always, going to be a reason to exit a trade and rarely a reason to stay. A market only moves in your favor a small portion of the time. The rest of the time, it's backing and filling, okay? As I said, over past several weeks, 75% of the time, markets seem to be going against you. So most of the time, markets will be going against you. A couple of random thoughts. Again, getting back to Bruce Lee, just do that one thing and get good at it. Uh, I've helped a few people, well, two in particular, <laughs> one kid and, and my own daughter, win or nearly win trading contests just by giving them one thing to do, one simple thing to do. And they do it because they don't care. They just do it. They just want to get out of the class. They don't want to become stock traders, okay? Although when I did show my daughter her account, she's like, is that real money? I'm like, no, we just, this is not real money. She's like, could that have been real money? I'm like, well, yeah, I guess. So she got pretty excited about it. But find one thing to do and just do that one thing over and over and over again. Get some help, okay? Find someone who can help you do what you're doing, who knows what they're doing, who could help you to see or help you to see what you should be looking for. And I'd like for that person to be me, but there are other people out there. Uh, follow along what they're doing to see if it makes sense to you because – what I'm doing makes a lot of sense to me, but it has to make sense to you. You have to be able to follow along. So get some help if you need to. Learn to make fewer but better decisions. One of the successful day traders at this conference, by his own estimates, had made over a half a million trades. Now, I would challenge him to look at those half a million trades. and. I would challenge him to see, could he have eliminated a lot of those trades? Could he have eliminated a lot of bad trades and picked much better trades? Now, he was successful, and I don't want to mess anyone up who's already successful. But I would challenge you to learn to make fewer but better decisions. I think we're only wired to make so many decisions in our life. Every time you make a decision, there's emotions, there's stress involved, there's physiological things that happen, okay? So it takes a toll on your body. And again, I think we're only wired to make so many decisions within our lifetime. And I think this gentleman who's made a half a million decisions trading, <laughs> I don't know how many decisions he have left. He has left. Now he must be he might be an extraordinary individual and pretty amazing stuff. But I would challenge him to make fewer decisions. I think you can only trade at that kind of level for so long, and then you're going to have to start broadening your horizons. And like I tried to tell some of these guys, and, and maybe it's falling on deaf ears because some of them are printing money, doing what they're doing, and it's like I don't want to mess you up. But down the road, begin to think that you can't – you're not going to be able to keep at this level of intensity forever. Physi physiologically, it's going to be impossible. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to broaden your horizons a little bit. Now, I'm not trying to stop them from day trading, but what I would suggest they do is maybe look into figuring out how to pick, number one, better day trades, and more importantly, number two, maybe hold on to that trade for a little while longer. Try to hold on to that trade for the majority of the day instead of being in and out 100 times. And once a trend does begin to develop, you're much better off just staying with the trade, whether that's intraday trade or interday trade. All right. Any questions, thoughts, comments, complaints? I know I kind of went around the block a little bit. At first, trading seems like an easy way to make a lot of money, but as you know, it's not. Yeah. And the, the problem with trading is the, it, it attracts the absolute worst people. It attracts the highly motivated, the highly educated people. And those are people who apply a high degree of logic 
and action to their careers. The guy that I said that did the um, that owned an IT company is more than likely uh, more than likely approached his business with a high degree of logic and also somebody's here I'm trying to figure out if they're what's going on uh, whether they need to get the AK out or not <laughs> Um, he approached his career with a high degree of logic and a high degree of motivation. In other words, he takes action or he took action, and he's a person of action. And in trading, there often there often isn't a lot of action, and there often isn't a lot of logic because you're dealing with the emotions of others while, of course, embracing your own. Uh, these announcements are left over, but I'm still working on a beginner's course. It probably will be for a long time. I thought I could just crank it out. But it kind of took a quick slant towards the trading psychology as I began thinking, what would I go back and tell this guy, this young punk version guy of myself? And I would say, don't chase the holy grail. Find one or two things. Do them. Get good at them. Then move on. A lot of things I just told you today. And it became, or it's becoming, I should say, very heavily into trading psychology. And hopefully I'll start recording that and have a, um, a multi-part uh, base up soon. I'm working on getting my audio right, my camera's right, the green screen, whole nine yards. So uh, keep an eye out for that soon. Also, make sure you're at least on a delayed service. If you go to my website, scroll down to get to getting started. There's a list of 10 things I'd recommend you do, one of which is follow along on the delayed service. So you can see things unfold without perfect hindsight, because a lot of times you'll see me in these presentations show you the stock. It's like, oh, yeah, we're long to stock. Well, don't just take my word for it. Get under delayed service. So a week from now, you'll actually see that stock show up as a direct recommendation. Now, I have a lot of free stuff on my website, so check that out. Like I said, I can keep you busy for a long, long time. Okay, now let's take a look at the overall market. Let's talk about that for a little while, and then we'll hop into your individual uh, stock questions. Yeah, I see some stock questions coming up. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Give me one second. Let me just make sure. Let me just, I hope that's just a Jehovah Witness that's here. Hang on. Okay, we're cool. All right. Let's start off with the P's. Well, the P's weren't that far away from new highs not that long ago. And as I often say, when the market is at or near new highs, err on the side of long-term trend. Don't rush out and do a whole lot of shorting. Well, that's begun to change a little bit because we sort of broke it down in here. The good news is we did hold the top, the bottom, I should say, of this recent range. Let's take a look at the spider so we get a true open on today's action. So we sold off a little bit on the open, and so far we reversed that. It'd be pretty cool if we close this little gap from this morning, too. Getting back to cash, round numbers, I think 2100 would be a good place to watch. Not that it's a line in the sand, but I would get more concerned if we drop below this, we might just be chopping back and forth based on this election. But it was me and uh, um, one of the guys I met at the conference, we uh, we asked the hotel, uh, can you put on the, uh, the the election on one of these screens you're not using over here? And I'm like, oh, no, we would uh, we would never we would never do anything political. I was like, wait, you got all this illegal, not illegal, but uh 
questionable, immoral behavior going on, but you're going to avoid politics? Anyway, we were like, how do we, how do we get to a point where we ended up with this? <laughs> where these are our only two choices. And it's, it, we kind of laugh because we came to the same realization at the same time. I think everybody's come to that realization already. But anyway, I think that's beginning to play out a little bit in the markets. It doesn't matter why the market's doing what it is, what it's doing. As Clinton said, the, uh, Bill Clinton, Bubba, what is, is, you know, no, no, no. The, uh, election Bill Clinton, what is, is, right? So whatever the market's doing, it's what the market's doing. And right now we're kind of chopping sideways. I like to look at net net and on a net net basis, we are right around where we were, where two months ago. Okay. And then if you want to go back further, you can go all the way back to last summer, obviously beginning of last summer, even further back than that. And we haven't made a whole lot of forward progress on a net net basis. Okay. So that's a little bit concerning and obviously a little choppy in here. So now's the time to get uh, very selective. Hopefully the gig is not up because we've been trading a lot of these high beta, so-called high beta stocks or high volatility stocks is what I just call them, high volatility stocks. And we've been doing really well up until now. We've gotten stopped out of a few over the last couple of days. Well, it happens, okay? I'm not as calm about it as I might seem right now. I still have a pulse, okay? So I still cuss and fuss, and I was in a pretty shitty mood yesterday, okay? So it still bothers me. I'm not as antiseptic as I might seem, but I'm not as bad as I used to be, so I'm definitely getting better. Peas off their worst levels, obviously, so far. So on an intraday basis, looking, I wouldn't say they look great, because they're still down over half percent, but certainly looking better, certainly finding a little support here, and certainly holding above 2,100. Uh, let's throw some moving averages in here. I didn't realize that we were below the 50. I don't look at the 50-day moving average that much until the market begins to fall apart a little bit, like it has or begins to sell off. And I didn't realize that the 50 was this high. So the 50 caught up with this high level. And what's kind of interesting is notice the 50 is kind of sitting right below this other range in here. Uh, I used to joke with another trader. A lot of times, a lot of technicals are all coming together at the same point. And it's kind of like the, the thermos joke. It keeps the hot things hot and the cold things cold. How do it know? Okay. So how does the market know? And it's just kind of interesting. So even without the 50-day moving average, you're like, oh, okay, well, there's a lot of resistance up here to get through. And you put the 50-day moving average in, it's like, oh, well, that's where the 50-day moving average is. So that's kind of interesting. And we obviously have broken down below that 50. Now, somebody pointed out we had some bow tie action not that long ago of all-time highs. And, yeah, that's, you're rightfully to be concerned about that, or you should be concerned about that. But I think follow-through is going to be more important. And we had the bow tie, and we kind of had a little throw back up towards those old highs, stalled out, and now we kind of roll back over. But I wouldn't get too excited just yet. Now, if we make a weekly bow tie – that's a different story. As we did last summer when I got all bearish on you, that's why I got all bearish. Last 30 years, we had bear markets after weekly bow ties, both up and down. This one didn't quite work. Hopefully, and there's that hope work again. I know Frenchie's in here. He says, did you say hope? <laughs> but hopefully, this isn't a second mouse signal where you get the bow tie, the market goes up, and then bow ties again. This is a real deal. So we will have to watch that, especially – on a weekly basis, okay? Now, uh, by the way, if you hit, uh, I don't know if you can do another charting packages, but what's cool about TC, it's a rolling two day, but it is a two day nonetheless. You hit two or you three or you four key, and you can get like a three day chart or a two day chart, whatever the case may be. So it's a little bit clearer and it looks a little bit less choppy on a three day chart. You can see we're just sitting on top of this range, but you can see the moving averages have begun to turn down. And by the way, as I often say, I learned this from Greg, with an exponential moving average, as soon as you cross below it, on a closing basis, it will turn down. So notice that the exponential turned down both here and here. With the simple, you can see the simple still headed high here, even though it closed below. It takes a while to catch up. I do like the simple for a shorter term time period because I like it to be a true representation of price, representation of price. I do like the 20 and 30 to be exponential because it catches the price a little bit quicker. All right, let's take a look at NASDAQ. NASDAQ was just a few days ago, right off of all-time highs. 
And since then, it's begun to implode a little bit. So I would keep an eye on, let's just say 5,100 round numbers. We get below that. Now we're going to have a lot of overhead supply to contend with. Let's throw that 50-day moving average in. And you can see today we're breaking down below that 50 decisively. And then also notice that the moving averages are beginning to turn down, as I just said they will when you cross below them, especially the exponential ones, after coming off of all-time highs. So we could get a, a, a daily bow tie signal off all-time high, all highs. You shouldn't completely ignore that, but it's not as scary as a weekly signal would be, okay? Let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty, as you can see, made it a bow tie down off of multi-year highs. Not quite all-time highs, but multi-year highs. Rusty scores a bit of a bummer. Let's get a clean chart on this one. Because it was just at these multi-year highs a few weeks ago, and now it's broken down a little bit. But let's keep an eye on 120, and this is the IWM, the ETF. This is what I like to watch. So as long as we stay about 120, I wouldn't say that all is good in the world, but it's certainly not as horrible as if we broke down as if we broke down below that 120 level. All right. Now, sector action is getting a little mixed in here. With the Nasdaq not too far from new highs, some areas like the semiconductors are looking okay. In fact, we probably should this will just take one minute, bear with me. We'll hop out to the major what I call a major mix. Um, but the semiconductors have pulled back into that prior little breakout. They were looking a lot better before this morning's uh, action. I haven't even looked at them since the market opened. But as long as they hold above or at this range, then I think they're okay longer term. If we break much below it, then I would begin to begin I would begin to get concerned. If we take a look at these major MIGs in here, you can see that more and more sectors are beginning to break down. And some of your stronger sectors like technology are selling off. Now, it might just be a pullback, but it could also be the beginnings of something much bigger. Software beginning to break down out of its range. So at this moment, and check back often, a lot of areas have begun to break down and or are banging out some new lows. Again, Simi's doing okay. Energy's kind of doing okay. They broke out recently, but they did kind of pull back into the base. So I wouldn't be too concerned about this. On a relative strength basis, they're doing a lot better than most other areas but in trouble, or not in trouble, but certainly uh, losing some of that upside momentum they had nonetheless. So as a general statement, things are deteriorating, but let's not get too excited. Let's not start shorting with both fists just yet, but do pay attention to what's going on. Real estate and anything interest rate sensitive, not looking so hot in here, such as utilities, as you can see, banging out recent new lows. Retail hasn't looked so great lately either. You can see it sold off fairly hard on the cusp of breaking down. This looks like a big picture topping formation. And then most areas, again, looking kind of questionable in here. What was kind of interesting a few days back is we had a liquidation type of market where bonds headed lower, gold headed lower, the overall market headed lower. So there was one there was there was no place there wasn't one place to hide. There was no place to run, no place to hide. Whenever that happens, I immediately get emails. Hey, Dave, is this a little scary from where you sit? And it's like, yeah, but it's just one day. But if we start seeing more and more liquidation type of days where everything gets thrown out, or some people would say the old Wall Street adage, the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater, then that's where you have to be, you have to pay attention. And that's where it gets a little scary. That means that somebody needs to raise cash and fast. Okay. So do pay attention when you see everything selling off like that. All right, let's open up for individual stocks. John says, uh, Pi looks like a good risk or reward entry above today's high and stop below 25. Pi was one that we were long up until a few minutes ago, and it's been a good ride. Um, in IPOs, I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to patterns. I would say yes, uh, but I would use a much more liberal entry. And you do have a little bit of overhead supply to contend with there. Let's take a look at like a two-day chart. Uh, the pattern that I'm seeing, if the daily looked like this, this would be perfect. This is a three-day chart. This is what I would call a double top knockout, where you get two minor little double tops and then a nice little knockout move. Now, I think it still looks pretty good. Um, I probably won't go after it again 
simply because we do have this resistance here. But I think it looks okay. I'm going to have to reevaluate it in after hours and talk about it a little bit. Uh, talk to myself about it, I guess. <laughs> uh, John, we're long that one, or just we're long that one. Let's stay away. Let's stay off the list for to for today. C R B P. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, HV is a little crazy up here, close to 100. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Um, it's going from two to ten pretty quick, or let's just say three to ten. Three, four hundred, five hundred percent move over a short period of time. Ah, it's a little bit on the crazy side, even for Big Dave. Okay, so before before I would get interested in a stock that went straight up like this, what I would suggest is just wait, let it knock out a little bit, see if it could sell off fairly hard and maybe knock out some traders because when it goes straight up like this, it's going to attract a lot of. Um, Eager shorts. I learned that over the weekend. A lot of these day traders are shorting these parabolic moves. I knew it was done, but I never met the people who actually did it. And that's kind of a brave thing to do and a scary thing to do because obviously it was parabolic 50% uh, ago. And now it's going up another 100% or 200%, whatever the case may be. And you can get into a lot of trouble really fast doing that. But I would wait for a big knockout move. That would suck some shorts in, and that would knock out some nervous Nelly type of longs, those who just bought right around here in the spirit of a trend knockout before looking to do anything with that, okay? John wants to know about AREX, AREX. Um, it's just kind of chopping around in here. With a pullback, my litmus test is that you start counting as soon as the – you start counting as soon as the stock makes a new high and begins to pull back. So if you were to, if you're trading a pullback, I should say, let's say you got a nice little trend and it makes a new high. So there's your new high. That's day one. This is day two. This is day three. This is day four. Usually after about somewhere between the 8 to 11 range, I begin to get a little nervous about this pullback. And I begin to ask myself, self, is this the beginning of a new downtrend or a sideways trend? Or is this just a consolidation or a pullback of the prior trend? Okay. So getting back to that chart, first thing that jumps out at me is, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 22, 23, 24, blah, blah, blah. About five, six, seven, eight weeks of trading since it made the new high. The other thing, too, it looks like we talked about this one last week since my chart is marked up. It pulled back below its prior breakout point. So usually I immediately toss out any stock that pulls back below its prior breakout levels. That plus the fact that it's too many days since it's pulled back. So for me to get interested in this stock again, it would have to break out to new highs and then pull back. I'm long from 308, okay, on September 22nd. Okay, well, just have a stop in place. Uh, as I often say, if you're long, stay long and let the stop take you out. Okay, May wants to look at GDX. hope I got your name right. GDX, GDX. This is the ETF. Um. I would be, if I was just seeing this particular chart, I'd say, well, you got the bow tie down and it's trending lower, okay? So I would say it's in trouble and it looks like it wants to come down to the old lows. Hey, Dave, why don't you short it? Well, I know when I back the chart out a little bit, it's rolling over off of relatively low levels. I'd be more excited about shorting something when it's coming off of much higher levels like it did back here, okay? That's a weekly chart. Then I am shorting it in here because you're, it's only at best probably just go back to the old lows. Bullish or bearish? Bearish. If you want to make a short-term trade, up or down? Down. Okay. I just be a little nervous shorting gold because everything's a little iffy right now, obviously. So I'd be a little careful in the goals. Okay. Anything commodity related? A E R I for Mr. Jim. Good to see you, Jim. Glad you made it. A E R I. Sorry about that problem we had earlier. Um, the gap is too big. 
You want to see gaps and laps and wide range bars in the direction of the trend. But in this case, it's too much of a good thing. When you see a market jump from 20 to 30 something overnight, that's a pretty big jump and it creates a bit of a, uh, I don't know what word I'm looking for. In equilibrium, if that is that a word? So I find markets kind of have this, they, they shoot higher like this and then they just tend to kind of chop around as we've seen so far in here. A-Rex, so I'd leave that one alone. Yeah, we talked about A-Rex, uh, NTNX. Yeah, I like this one. The only, the only caveat here is that I was looking at this one yesterday is that it did have quite the move in here coming out of the gate. So I'm a big fan of these pioneer patterns. I call that a flagpole where they come up and make that kind of like a, it's like a flag or a first deep retracement, whatever you want to call it in these IPOs. But in this case, it was fairly extreme. I prefer, like if it's, this was lower price, hopefully this will make sense. If this was lower price and made a similar move on a percentage basis, I would be more excited about it than a higher priced IPO and pull back. A lot of times if a, an IPO is priced too high, as I, I said in the course, price too high, they're going to die. So that's the one thing we have to be careful. So I think I would almost wait for this. We'll just go to, to bang out some new highs uh, before getting too excited. If I didn't have the scaling over here to see that it went from, what was that? Let's take a look at that. It went from 26 to 46 overnight. That's a pretty big move. So I think I would pass on that one. Even crazy, crazy volatile stock trader, Big Dave would pass on that one. But I hear you. I see what you're saying. I mean, it could easily make a pop back up to the old highs. And is it worth it? I don't know. T-Pick for Jim. T-Pick, we got stopped out of yesterday. I think I would leave it alone now. Um, this one didn't quite materialize for us. Obviously, we got stopped out at a loss. Not a full loss, but a loss nonetheless. I think I would leave it alone. And you sort of have to factor in the overall market, too. And you also have to be careful not to fight the last war. Uh, I've been a huge fan of IPOs for quite some time, and they've been working really well. And this time when the market sold off, the IPOs sold off with it. Like I said earlier, it's like everything went down, okay? So is that the beginning, uh, is that the beginning of the end of the IPO bull market? I don't know. Uh, the day I started an IPO trading service would be that day. I, I was going to start one three years ago, but I was worried the bull market might be ending. <laughs> CLD, yeah, that was a, that's a crazy one. Um, CLD has been a pretty good run. Uh, metals and mining, I guess that's a, a coal stock, if I had to guess. Uh, great eye, good pattern, needs a little more pullback. But, yeah, that's on my momentum list. That's on my watch list. Absolutely. Kaza for Kahan. Kaza? Uh, no, it's a little too wide and loose and all over the place, okay? And also, look at how thin this stock is, especially for a $1 stock or dollar and change stock. So be careful with that. I would avoid that. I mean, unless you bought some and put a stop in at zero, you know, if you, I hate to say fundamental because that's totally against what I do, but unless you had a reason to own this stock, avoid it. It looks like electric cordogram. Also, look at all this overhead supply in here and just keep in mind that markets have long memories. MTL for Andre. Okay. MTL looks kind of interesting. And that it's kind of taken off in here, and now it's pulled back. I guess my only concern is that it has lost some momentum because on a net-net basis, you can go back to September. So I think what I would do, I mean, you could certainly do much worse. It's not bad. At initial glance, initial look, it looks pretty good. But I think I would wait for this one to bust out to new highs and then play pullbacks along the way. But you could certainly do much worse. And I do like the fact that it is coming off of – relatively long le uh, low levels longer term so it's not bad ntnx for mr matt 
Yeah, we talked about that one. Uh, ESNC. Uh, kind of kind of low price. I wouldn't automatically eliminate a stop because it's low price. It's back to chart out a little bit. A little choppy, but you can see it's kind of getting its act together. Uh, maybe on a pullback, okay? But it is borderline a penny stock, but maybe on a pullback. Absolutely. SWKS. Now, immediately, I kind of see this is kind of wide and loose. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. And then on a net-net basis, you can see it's kind of back to where it sort of broke out from. So it's not it's not the worst stock I've ever seen, but I think I would see if it could rally and then maybe play pullbacks. The only thing I don't like is it's coming off of these mid-levels like this. I like them when they're either in established uptrends like back here or making a transition off of major, major, major lows. So I would I would try to find something before that. Okay, uh, May would like to look at TSLA. I'm probably not going to like it because it's a big, thick stock, and it trades like electric cardiogram. So it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. Um, from your name, I don't know if, um, if you're familiar with electric cardiograms. I'll show you what that looks like if I can find it. E-L-E-C-T-R-O, electric cardiogram. So electrocardiogram is a measure is a heart is a measurement for your heart. And it looks like that. That's what an EKG looks like. So if the stock looks like an EKG, as I often say, if you can hear like a beep, beep, beep while looking at the stock, then it's probably not a stock you want to trade. Apple is a big thick stock. It trades a gazillion shares a day. So I'd be a little leery about trading that but it can trend at times okay uh i would wait to see if apple could break out decisively to new highs and then look to play pullbacks i personally wouldn't trade it just because well here's the other problem too you have overhead supply in here anybody who bought from let's say 120 to 130 might be looking to get out at break even i think you could f probably find something that's trending a little bit better and then also by waiting for an entry, given the fact that the market is somewhat dubious, by waiting for an entry, that in and of itself might keep you out of trouble. CDEV for Donald. Good to see you, Donald. CDEV. Good. I'm, I'm glad you guys made it uh, in spite of all my technical difficulties and uh, stupidities. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Um, I would like to know what they do, though. Centen usually I don't care as long as I know what sector they're in, but... Uh, look them up to make sure you know what sector they're in. It says diversified investments. That could be anything. That could be gold. That could be silver. That could be a shell company. Uh, it's had a pretty good run in here. I'd, I'd wait for a deeper pullback based on the nature of its run. So the sharper this angle is, the more pullback you want. And you could just, you know, here's a, here's a deal. And this might not seem like an epiphany to you, but it's kind of a cool thing to do. Would you have a chart that looks like this? Let me clean it up and show you. One thing I like to do sometimes, and you'll see me doing the chart show sometimes, is draw a line, kind of connect all the lines in here, and then draw a line down to where you think it should pull back to retrace this trend. Okay, does that make sense? I tend to eyeball it quite often, but if you actually draw the line, I would say it would have to pull back to at least 14. And the reason you want that to happen is, number one, as I said earlier, you want to make sure some shorts get sucked in. You want to make sure some shorts feel pretty good about the trade. You want to make sure some shorts are making money on the trade. Does that make sense? Because they get in, they feel good, they're making money. And then, not that you want to see them punish, but what what's going to happen is if that market turns around, they're going to get squeezed out, and that's going to help propel your trade higher. And you also want to see some nervous Nellies get shaken out in the spirit of a trend knockout. Okay, you want to see that these – a sell-off hard enough to where anybody who got into the stock late in the game will be shaken out. The problem with the nervous Nellies is they, they often don't have staying power and they're often the first, the last in and the first out and they could wreak havoc on your positions. And usually the shorts pile in right around that time. I don't know why it is, but shorts have a bit of an ego. And as I said, over the weekend, a lot of these guys are sharding or shorting uh, parabolic moves. I said sharding. I bet they're, they're probably sharding if the move, if the stock keeps going higher, but that's a that's another story. But when that stock turns around and goes right back up, it squeezes them out, 
And then the nervous Nellies, the Johnny Come Latelys, they have to make a decision whether or not they're going to get back in or be left behind. Art wants to know about NTES. Okay, Art, good to see you. Thanks for making it. Thank you all for making it. In spite of my technical difficulties. Yeah, this needs to go on your watch list. The volume's a little high. Um, I, I think you could probably find something a little bit more speculative, uh, given the nature of the market. But maybe on a knockout move. My only concern is it has lost a little steam in here. So, yeah, it's in a trend. If you're long, stay long. Maybe once it pulls back a little bit, it might be worth a shot. But it's not really jumping out of me at this juncture. O-C-L-R. Um, this has got a bit of that double top knockout look that I was talking about just recently. Uh, maybe on a two-day chart, it's a little bit more obvious. See on a, on a three-day chart, you could see nice little kind of flat top here, a little knockout move. It It's not bad, okay? But it does have quite a bit of trading in here. But it's not bad, given the volatility. It's volatile enough to maybe it could pop right back up. So I would give that one okay. I don't think I would personally go after this one. But it's not bad. You could certainly do much worse. Okay. I don't know if that's talking out of both sides of my mouth or not. Easy PW, is that it? No, it's too flat, Andre. Um, but I think, as I said last week, it, it, it does appear to be setting up in that Darvis kind of manner where it's making a box on top of a box. So if you're long, stay long. The other thing, too, retail's getting cream lately. We talked about retail earlier. So I think I would stay away from uh, retail. A, B, E, O, A, B, E, O. Yeah, this looks kind of interesting. Now, it did kind of barely get past its prior peak, but the fact that it's going kind of straight up in here, I think that kind of trumps that. And then also, as I said earlier, draw your line in, and it would have to get below 550, maybe even close to 5 to shake out some people. Because look at the move in here is what, 200% uh, round numbers? Especially if you come way back here, you can get another 25% in there. So, yeah, let it let it pull back a little bit. SWKS for Greg. Good to see you, Greg. Hadn't seen you in a while. SWKS. Did we talk about this one? Yeah, we talked about this one. And finally, ESNC. Any more? Oh, no no worries, Greg. Uh, did we cover it? We'll go. Did we, I forget what. I think we covered it. If not, um, we'll cover it again. Yeah, we talked about this one. Uh, rewind the uh, tape when um, – I'll get it loaded as soon as I get done. Oh, no, don't, no worries. I just don't want to bore everybody going through it again. Too late? <laughs> yeah, this looks good. Uh, put this on your watch list if we haven't already talked about this. Uh, but wait for a pullback. A little on the thin side, but wait for a pullback. And, again, let's draw it in. You know, that's pullback, something like that, to knock some people out. UUP is a dollar. I'm bullish on the dollar and short the yen right now. Uh, but the dollar in and of itself, it's sort of wide and loose. So I wouldn't rush out and trade the dollar. The, the yen versus dollar looks something like this back here. And that's the move I'm playing. Okay. But the dollar in and of itself, uh, shorter term is in a nice little trend. But intermediate to somewhat longer term, as you can see, it's just got a sideways in here. But certainly hanging in there as of late. Okay. Any more? Well, again, uh, my apologies for the technical difficulties. Uh, hopefully, we'll have it ironed out by next week. There's a few things I'm going to do to make sure that doesn't happen again. And uh, and we should only get better with that. Uh, I think GoToWebinar changed something in their software, which made it hard for me to, to get these things set up. But I'll, I'll get I'll work through it, and I'll get it fixed. Uh, any answer questions, shoot me an email at dave at dave. Landry.com. If we don't talk between now and the weekend, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next Thursday. Thank you so much.